a heads up, this episode is going to get real. There will be some unbleeped swearing and conversations about mental health issues and suicide. If your heart is feeling heavy today, you may want to sit this one out. It's not easy. Love is not easy. You know, it's, um, for me, something that I hold deep inside. And I'm a very private person when it comes to feelings. If you've been listening to the show, you must know by now that I like to talk about feelings. Big feelings, small feelings, feelings about having feelings. I like to just get right on in there and speak with people heart to heart from a place of radical and unapologetic vulnerability. And speaking with people on this level takes time. Because in order to be vulnerable, you have to trust. And nothing says, trust me, I'm safe, like a microphone shoved in your face. So typically, the show you hear is a streamlined version of lengthy, deep conversations with folks so that they do indeed end up feeling safe. And I can hear it when they get there. I can hear when people relax with me, when they trust me. Sometimes they get there after one hour together, sometimes after four, and sometimes, as this episode taught me, they don't get there at all. This is Homegoings. I'm Myra Flynn. Today on the show, I'm talking with Black men as I comb the streets of Southern California and even my own home in search of a heartfelt answer to what I deemed a very simple question. I'm asking, how are you doing? How am I doing with what? Turns out, simple ain't the word, and for good reason. I don't think it's masculine for an alpha male to conduct itself in such a feminine style of response to things. You know, some things you just, as a man, you just got to deal with. Why does my black trauma intrigue you so much? Why you got to, like, why do you got to be tapped into my black pain to feel connected? What's that about? This is Homegoings. Welcome home. Let's be honest. How are you doing is a hard question for a lot of us to answer. We don't live in a society that really wants to know. Saw a colleague of mine and I walked into the office and he said, hey, Phil, how you doing? So, you know, how are you doing is sometimes it's just a way to an expression of saying hi to somebody and not really asking how they're doing. This being said, many of us figure out a way to talk about how we're doing eventually. We get there. Maybe it's with a friend or a therapist, someone we feel safe with. So when it came to the Black men I interviewed for this episode, I noticed there's something else going on here entirely. Getting them to really think about this question and answer it, I didn't think it would be this hard. It's like nowhere is safe, even if you're married to them. Hi. 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 Who are you to me? I am your husband. (laughs) Are you sure? I am sure. This is Phil Wills, my husband of nearly six years. Phil was raised in Essex Junction, Vermont, and I was raised just an hour away. But somehow, Phil and I never met until we both settled in Los Angeles. I've always thought that was kind of a magical story. Anyway, Phil is defined in our house as a lot of things. He's a black man. He's a father to our daughter, Avalon. He's a TV star. He's a pull back the doors, bust open the books, and make a call for help to Bar Rescue. I've uh, been on television, show Bar Rescue, for the last five or six years. Phil is one of the fastest bartenders I've ever seen. And you bring life to it. You build it up. And then there are some things he isn't. 
like a big talker, especially when it comes to how he's feeling. This might be a more difficult question for you to answer with me because I'm your wife, but feel free to say it all. That's fine by me. The question is, how are you doing? How am I doing? Yeah. I am doing good. Is that a question? (laughs) We're laughing here, but I'll admit that sometimes this is a sore spot for us. I'll be the first to say we communicate in two very different ways, but it's still kind of wild that I can't get him to answer this question. I'm his wife. I'm supposed to know everything, right? And Phil does have feelings. He's just more of a show not tell type of guy. I tend to show my love in actionable ways. Meaning I'll make sure the house is clean or you know, take care of some, some of the responsibilities that are a little, little bit more heavy lifting and make sure that my family is taken care of. But when asked to talk about his feelings at times, Phil can be so darn optimistic You gotta wonder, what's really going on in there? Life is fun. I'm doing well with life. I'm doing well with life. It's fun. It's it's a ride. But life is good. I'm a happy person. So how are you doing? How am I doing? Like, yeah. So like, Let's see, you're kind of giving like broad advice to the world on like love and life. I'm asking, how are you doing? How am I doing with what? So here we are, which is to say, We're pretty much where we started. Perhaps my needling curiosity about this black man I'm married to is what sparked this episode. Maybe I'm trying to heal our house or something. But the truth is, Phil is not an anomaly. For many black men, vulnerability is not something that lives in their lexicon. Which is tragic because we are living in a time where the images of police brutality and violence and murder of black men has never been so accessible. And the fear in our community, at least in my days on this earth, has never been so palpable. I'll let let this cop pass by. Do you feel like you should stop talking when the cop passes by? No, I think I should talk louder when a cop passes by. Let my voice be heard. If you had one word to describe how you're doing, what would that word be? Maintaining. That's that's the word that I feel is pretty solid in my life in these past few years, really, is just maintaining. If Black men are suffering, they are doing so largely silently. And that has ramifications for things like physical and mental health challenges, which are also on the rise. According to the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, Black people are 20% more likely to experience serious psychological distress, like major depressive disorder, than white Americans, yet are less likely to seek treatment due to the inherent and validated distrust in the medical system. In short, self-care, historically not really in the Black vocabulary. And don't get me started on the social expectations of Black men and the myth of maintaining masculinity. I mean, this stuff is well documented and out there. It's doing real harm. So it feels to me like asking Black men how they're doing isn't just important. It's triage. When's the last time someone asked you how you're doing? I guess it's the last time somebody really stopped me, looked in my eyes and said, how are you doing? No, really, how are you doing? Um, It's been a while since that that has happened. I can't remember the timeline, but I'd have to say that you were probably the last person that really asked me how I was doing and want to know how I'm truly doing. So 
doesn't come often, unfortunately. Need to check in more often. Hello? Hey, what's up? Are you Ron? Yes, ma'am. It's Myra. We spoke on the phone. Yeah, how are you doing? I'm good. Sorry to interrupt. No, nice no. to meet you. Me too. You too. Yeah, I see you already have a customer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so early in the morning. I love it. Gotta get going. This is Ron Coleman, the owner of Ron's Barbershop in Pasadena, California. When I asked if I could visit his shop, he told me to come between 7 and 8 a.m. before it gets hot. If you look online, there are plenty of group therapy options for Black men with taglines like healing in brotherhood or black but not broken. But this episode got me thinking about the spaces Black men did, in fact, heal in brotherhood before they were seen as human enough to be woven into the self-help system. And this curiosity... This is what brings me to Ron and his barbershop. This is the first barbershop thing you did? Or you did yeah. The first, one? first time I've been in a barbershop for it. It just seemed right with the subject of just how. When I arrive, Ron is already very much up and at him. I've come on shave day for his customer, Reggie Woods, which according to Ron is every Friday. That's a radical shave job. Thank you. <laughs> He beat up the last barber, so he, I got to make sure I get him right. <laughs> uh, he going to throw me out there like that, man. Front street. See, when I was cutting... When I was you might be hearing that this is not a quiet sit-down interview. I'm dropping in on Ron's workday, so he keeps working the whole time we speak, which means I'm picking up a lot of noise. Clippers, soul music, the game on TV. And as stimulating as it is from an audio perspective, it's got nothing on the powerful visuals in his shop. His walls are peppered with some of the most powerful black men and leaders this world has ever known. You can look at the, the decor of the shop and look what I stand for. I mean, I have Honorable Elijah Muhammad on my wall. I have Malcolm X, Huey P. Newton, Nelson Mandela, Shaka Zulu, uh, Dr. Francis Crest Wellsby. I have Dr. Amos Wilson. I don't know if you're familiar with some of these people. Uh, you should look them up. Ron's shop has been open for a decade, and Ron himself has been cutting hair since 1982. When he was around the age of 12, he swept the floor of his local barber shop and was quickly promoted. When I started cleaning his clippers, I felt like I graduated. That was a big thing for a kid to clean the barber's clippers. <laughs> it's like a rite of passage kind of thing? Yeah. So Ron was hooked. By the job, yes, but even at 12, he realized something special was happening in that shop. I didn't know I wanted to cut hair, but I just enjoyed listening to the conversations they were having, you know. I was sweeping the floor, but I was ear hustling like a mug. It was just interesting to hear men speak about things that were happening around our community. I'm visiting Ron for similar reasons. I'm hoping I can ear hustle, eavesdrop, or maybe even be allowed into some of the conversations with the Black men here. Because the barbershop is about so much more than cutting hair. The rise of Jim Crow laws in the late 1800s, early 1900s, limited spaces where Black people could gather. The church was one of those allowed spaces. The barbershop was another. The Black barbershop, it was a gathering place for Black men. The foundation of us without being harassed by the police. We can come in and, and vent out things that happened throughout the week, a uh, uh, social event that took place. It was stirred, but you want to find a job. The black barbershop had the you know, resources, a uh, new somebody. You need your car fixed, anything that you need. We was the original Google. You feel me? You want to find out something, you come to the community, go to the barbershop. That's when the barbershop was a, a pillow in our community. There was two people that was most respected in our community as black men. That was the preacher and the barber. Those are the two men who knew all your secrets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> barber shit, I'm telling you. <laughs> it was crazy. As much as I love waxing history with Ron, the time has come for me to ask my question. One question I've been asking black men is, how are you doing? And here we go. Ron answers my question about his emotions by talking about the emotions of others. After all, if the barbershop is, as he calls it, therapy for black men, Ron is the therapist. 
I've had um, guys that tell me stuff that, you know, I, I me personally, I don't think I would have told nobody that. <laughs> but uh, sometimes you have to get stuff off your chest. And I think the black barbershop, it was like a therapy session for men, for black men. And not to be uh, feminized for having emotions. Now, you don't want to have too much emotions, but it's okay to have some kind of outlet to express psychologically what you're dealing with. You, you know what I mean? Why don't you want to have too much emotions? I don't think it's masculine for an alpha male to, to conduct itself in such a feminine style of response to things. You know, some things you just, as a man, you just got to deal with. That's why I'm from the old school. I ain't from the, the new men crying and all that. I ain't even with that. But it's okay if you have to show those emotions. Even a pit bull will cry. From therapy to masculinity, Ron moves on to talking with me about Farrakhan. Minister Louis Farrakhan. Uh, he's been committed. He has a track record of loyalty to the issues that impact us as African Americans. He teases a little bit about our collective feelings. The impact that the nation has had on our people is undeniable. Then Reggie weighs in with some thoughts on his favorite black male leader. Jesus Christ was a brother. He was a black man. Yes, he was. He was a man of color, so he's the only person that ever did it perfect. We can never be perfect, and I'm okay with that. Until I realize, it's time to shut this party down. Can I make an observation? Mm -hmm. So both of you, I have asked how you're doing, like how your hearts are doing, and neither one of you have answered the question yet. Um, us as black men, we're facing a lot of mental challenges that we haven't faced in a long time as a group. Uh, one of the things is it took me almost two weeks to watch George Floyd, the murder. And I had to get my mind right because that could be my son, could be me, it could be any one of us. And that makes you feel? That makes me feel scared. Mic check, one, two. Mic check, one, two, three, four. Mic check, one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. Mic check, one, two. Good? We're good. My name is Everett Saunders, um, Everett Assis. Uh, I am a sound designer, uh, composer for theater and for film. Um, also producer for anything sound related and all around sound experimentation, sound installations, sound. I'm a sound guy. I'm intimidated. I'm going to have to make this sound good. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. You're so good. Everett Saunders is a self-proclaimed Philly cat, originally from Philadelphia, who I met at a party a while back. While everyone was mingling, he and I, total strangers at the time, locked ourselves in the room with the piano and wrote a song. I tell you this so you can get a sense of how deep Everett is usually willing to go, quickly. Though I know Everett, he's tough to know because of his schedule. Everett resides in Pasadena, California about half of the year, and during the rest he does indeed do sound all over the country and sometimes the world. So he doesn't really stay still. And although he's constantly exposed to people, finding community can be a harder task. What's that saying? Water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink? So Everett gets creative when it comes to forming his community, especially his community of other Black men, which he intentionally seeks out and curates. He meets on a monthly Zoom group with these men. And if you're thinking they meet up to talk about kids cooking in Congress, guess again. I had just got off of a conference call with a group of black men, about four of us, and one of the brothers on the call was hit with something that literally brought tears to my eyes. Um, 
something that was so it was very unjust. Um, it took uh, five years of his life. He wasn't incarcerated or anything like that, but it took five years of his life in fear of possibly being incarcerated for something that he had no 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 involvement when in at all. How does anyone release the idea of possibly having your whole family ripped away from you, being taken and put away for something that you had no involved, you had nothing to do with at all? Living in fear for five years of your life that you could be incarcerated, it, it drives a person to levels of insanity. Um, it drives a person to suicidal thoughts. Now, Everett isn't talking about himself here, but he's not not talking about himself either. Because this could be him. Someone he loves has lived in fear of being incarcerated for the last five years, which is sadly an all too familiar story. In Black America, Black men just sit back and watch the system rinse and repeat. And I think the fact that that's still a possibility that happens in, in this country is disappointing to say the least. You know, it's, it's I don't know if this is an edited show, but it, I'm going to say it's fucked up. What happened to him can happen to any black male at any given point in time. It doesn't matter what kind of life they're living, anyone. You could have, you could be the straight, this dude don't even, he don't drink, don't smoke, don't do nothing. You can be so straight and narrow and at any given time, your life can be in jeopardy and in trauma. So how I'm doing is basically to say, I'm as good as expected to be from a person who has to constantly live in a state of possible trauma every single day of their life. So am I doing good? No, not at all. There it is, an answer. Everett is not doing great. But if you can imagine not doing great, living in fear and dodging emotional trauma on the daily might not be the worst of it. Go ahead and add a side of subjugation to that plate. I'm also very frustrated at the fact that my doing is based upon other people who don't look like me. So that's a whole other thing. What, what do you mean by that? Oh, I'm talking about white people. As you know, in each episode of Homegoings, we end with a deep listen. Up until now, that's been some form of performance art, but not today. Today, Everett is our deep listen. So sit back, take a breath, and let the listen in. This is Everett Saunders, black man, father, sound guy, gifting us his vulnerability. And that is one hell of a piece of art. I say society, and I've realized I've, I've been saying society for so long that I mean white society. This, this idea that white people can write laws and rules that don't really apply to them, very much apply to melanated people, and we're all supposed to abide by it. You know, because everyone's, hey, everybody, everybody says they're innocent when they go to, yeah, but some of the brothers that are in there actually are. And their lives are gone. The systemic forms of how these things are, are put down, they've been put in place to keep black people under control, specifically black men, because if you break down the black man, you break down the black family. And if you're able to break down the black family, then you can break down black people. One of the hardest and one of the real, the real most gangster jobs in the world, and that's being a husband and a father, a black husband and a, a black father. That's some gangster shit in America because 
white society does not want you to have a successful union with family because it's a threat. They see it as a threat to their industry, to their system. Whether white people are writing the rules or whether they're enforcing the rules, it's all systems of oppression. And until we really start talking about systems of oppression and dismantling systems of oppression and how white people participate in those, some of those things, you know, you're always gonna have black men who are never really doing okay. I understand it's not easy, but we need each other so bad. I am more and more seeing how it extremely um, important it is for black males to have space with other black males, to exchange stories, to exchange hardships. So you know you're not alone because you're going to feel alone. I feel alone every single day. And there's so many good brothers around. I don't know no deadbeat dads. I don't know no, you know, whack husbands. I don't know any. But I do know we don't talk to each other enough. Do I break down all the time? No. You know, I'm still the product of my father, my grandfather. You know, there's still a certain amount of strength that's embedded. You know, don't talk about why black men die earlier than everybody else. Because you've been holding on to shit for decades. For decades. And it's not, it's not because, oh, we're just trying to be super strong. No, it's because you have to. And having an emotional release, you don't always get to do it. And sometimes black men just need to have a good cry. And it, but it, for us, it comes in, in death. When someone dies, then we allow ourselves to cry. If a black person asks me how I'm doing, you already live in this, you live in the same world I live in. So for me to be like, oh, I'm great. It's like bullshit. <laughs> you're, not, you're not great. Um, what are you talking about? I mean, you don't have to ask me. Turn on the turn on the news. You, you can, can see, see how, how black, black men are, are doing. doing. Thank you so much for listening to Homegoings, a righteous space for art and race. It's been a pleasure being here with you. And as you've heard today, wellness in black communities is not a one size fits all approach. If you are in need of support, you can call, text, or chat at 988. They're available 24-7 and have some resources that can help. Special thanks to Jay Green, Aquavis Warfield, and all the customers at Ron's Barbershop who didn't mind me messing with their shaves. Also thanks to Elodie Reed, who is the graphic artist behind all of our Homegoings artist portraits. Elodie makes a new one for each episode, and Everett is front and center this week. Check them out at homegoings.co. This episode was mixed, scored, and reported by me, Myra Flynn. I also composed the theme music and the music under our deep listen. Other music by Blue Dot Sessions and Jay Green. Brittany Patterson edits our show, and James Stewart contributes to so many things on the back end of making this thing come to life. So, speaking of the question du jour... How are we doing? If you have any thoughts on the podcast, folks you think I should talk to, or subjects you feel super passionate about us covering, write me an email at hey at homegoings.co. While you're there, you can sign up for our bi-monthly newsletter and give us a follow on Instagram at we are homegoings. See you in two weeks for another episode of Homegoings. As always, you are welcome here. One thing that I see in the art world, 
Why do people love black trauma? You know, it's it's entertainment in a sense. So what's that about? What what's let's talk about that psyche for a second. Why does it why does my black trauma intrigue you so much? Why you gotta like why do you gotta be tapped into my black pain to feel connected? What's that about? 